whole Bible is about acquitting the wicked. God's great plan of salvation to acquit the wicked. God finding a way to get that done. There is a holy kind of anger, indignation, anger at the wrong things, anger that this boy is going and wasting his time doing this thing and does not respect your love and what you're trying to do for him. It's, you have every right to be angry because you provide for him, you take care of him, and you care about him, you have a good plans for him, right? So anger is not like what you think, you know, people just cancel all anger, you know, and they say you cannot get angry at all as a Christian. No, you got to get angry at the injustices in the world. So we dealt with all that. Now let's go to the second thing. God is just. That's why he is he's full of vengeance. That's why he's jealous. And that's why he's angry. The, third th the second thing is, God is powerful. God is powerful. Now you read this in verses 3, 4, and 5. Let's read verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Now notice how these two things are put together. 
I'm glad it didn't say God is great in power because then you have to run and hide somewhere and there is no place to hide from God. If he's just a God of great power, he'll find you and get you, man. You know, you're finished. But thank God it puts this first. God is slow to anger and great in power. That means even though he's all powerful, extremely powerful, he is not a God who's just going to come out and take quick action. If he did that, we'll all be finished. Thank God, because he's slow to anger. Even though he's so powerful, he's slow to anger. That is why we exist, we keep breathing, we keep going. And in spite of all the wickedness and sin that's in the world, you know, rain is falling, and, uh, you know, trees are yielding, and our crops are yielding, and we're eating, and we're breathing the air. We're having a good time. The mango is still sweet. For all that Adam sinned and his generations, mango should have become bitter by now. Cursed. But God is good. He left some taste in the mango. I had one yesterday. <laughs> oh, it was so good. And I thank God that with the fall, he didn't cancel out the taste in this thing, you know. That would have been very bad, isn't it? A world without mango? God is a good God. That's why this Bible says the earth is full of God's goodness. Everywhere you see God's goodness. When it rains, it doesn't rain just on saints' heads. It rains on everyone's heads. When the lands yield, not just the believer's lands yield, everybody's lands yield. You know, your mango is sweet, my mango is sweet, and everyone else in the street who doesn't attend church, their mangoes are sweet. They're eating the same mangoes. So God is kind to the good, bad, and the ugly, I would say. So God is good, you see. God is a kind God. You know. And the thing is this. God is powerful. But why we're able to go on, why the world is able to go on and enjoy some kind of goodness of God in all realms of life, even though the world is wicked and displeases God in so many ways and dishonors God in so many ways, why are we able to go on and still have the blessing of God? Because God is slow to anger. Even though he's very powerful, he doesn't stretch out his hand readily to do harm. Because he's a God who is love. He's slow to anger. Right? Now, he tells this to these people because these people think, who, the Ninevites, these wicked people, they've become so wicked because they've got a boldness inside of them. They think, well, 100 years he's done nothing. Must be, he must be an important God. He doesn't have power. He doesn't have the ability to do things. So let's go on doing it. He can't do anything. So he says, look, don't you think that God is not powerful? God is powerful. And he quotes three, he points them to three things. One, he points them to the heavens. He said, look at the heavens, you'll see the power of God. In, chapter, in verse 3, he, you read this. The Lord is slow to hang on great power, and will not acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way, listen to this, in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. In other words, he's saying, look at the heavens, the whirlwind, the storm, and the clouds are all at his disposal. If he unleashes them, if he wants to do something, it's all in his hands. They're all in his control. If he wants to unleash them in one second, you'll all be wiped out. It's all in his hands. He's very powerful. Don't you think for a moment that He's a powerless God. He's a powerful God, he says. Then verse 4, he rebukes the sea. Now, now he's talking about the waters. Look at the waters, he says. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. And dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Car Carmel wither. And the flower of Lebanon wilts. I'm sure he had the splitting of the Red Sea in mind and the drying up of Jordan so that people can cross, all of this in mind. 
He's saying, listen, history has witnessed God's power on this earth. God is so powerful. He can dry up the sea. He can dry up the rivers in no time. He can dry it up so that there'll be no water. All your flowers and all your wonderful greenery will wilt and wither away in no time. You'll have no water, no rain, nothing if God turns off the water. I don't know how it's now back in those days when you used to rent a house and if they tell you to vacate, if you didn't vacate, the owner, thank God they are not gods. The owner will turn off the water first. He will first turn off the water if you don't leave and if you insist on staying, he'll turn off the water first because he knows then you'll be running. You can't live without water there. God could have turned off the water on us a long time ago on the earth after Adam sinned or after some generations when the world became so wicked. He saw mankind and said, oh, man, all he's got is just wickedness. He's full of wickedness in his heart. Yet he made sure we had 24-hour water. Now these people have put pipes for it and charging us for it. But he gave us free, actually. Thank God they've not piped it and uh, they've not piped air now and selling us uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, you know, that might happen next. Man is trying all God's resources, selling all his resources, but God has given all these things rich and free. Free. God is gracious. God is full of loving kindness. God is patient. God is slow to anger. Even though the world has become very wicked in so many ways and displeases God, God does this. So he's reminding them, look, he can turn off the water in no time, just like that, and that will finish you. Yeah, God is powerful. Then verse 5, he says, look at the earth. He says, the mountains quake before him, the hills melt. The earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. <laughs> he says, if God wishes he's so powerful, he can just burn up the whole earth. Just completely do away with it. Just finish with it. And not one person will be left. He says, he's so powerful, but he has not done it. He will not do it. He will not do it, he says. Why? Because he's full of loving kindness. He is full of grace, slow to anger, and so on. So far he has not, he has kept quiet. He has not used his power in that way. So he says, don't you think that God is not powerful? God is very powerful. Thank God that some people are not gods. If some people were gods, we would have been all gone a long time ago. If they didn't like us, they'll get rid of us in a moment. But God is so good that he has kept us going. The wicked, the good, bad, and the ugly all coexist together. God is patiently waiting for everybody to repent and change and turn to him and be changed. All right. So God is powerful, he says. God is just. That's why he is full of jealousy. He's full of the spirit of avenging making it right, and then he is angry. God is, has great power, but he's slow to anger. That's why, you know, he, he just allows us to continue all these years and waits and waits and waits. But then he goes to the third thing, that God is love. God is full of love and mercy. His love and mercy is immeasurable, literally unlimited, literally, you know. Now, verse 7 is an amazing verse put right in the middle of all this. After you read verse 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and all that, look at verse 7. Totally different color. It says, the Lord is good. How do you like that? <laughs> After saying God is jealous, God reserves his wrath for the sinner, God will take vengeance on his adversaries, you know, and all these things, and how God can just do anything. He's so powerful. He can destroy in one minute. 
Then he says, the Lord is good, right? What a nice place to put it in. He puts everything in context. He says, the Lord is good, verse 7, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. Marvelous word, ins verse inserted right in the middle of the strong verses of judgment and warning. Now, how do we, what do we make of this verse? The Lord is good, stronghold in the day of trouble. What is he talking, what day of trouble he's talking about? Now, we think always in general terms, when we have trouble, he's a strong. Well, he's that too. But here, particularly in this context, he's talking about a judgment, an impending judgment, soon to come, sure to come. He says, the Lord is good. I'm warning you. He's just, he's powerful. Don't go on doing what you're doing, he says. The judgment is going to come. You will see it happen. It's not that he will never do it, but... He's waiting and he's slow to anger. So I'm telling you, he says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. That means when that trouble comes, when that judgment comes, when that punishment comes, he will be the stronghold. You can hide yourself in him. He will be like a rock that you can take refuge in. You can escape from that judgment. You can be safe from what's going to fall on the sinners, he says. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who trust in him. In other words, he says, those who trust in him are safe. If you haven't trusted in him, trust in him. That's the only way to escape. Now, in verse 3, we passed by something, one sentence. I kept it for now. So let's go back to it. In verse 3, it says, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And look at this. And will not acquit the wicked. That means will not let the wicked go, simply just like that. Will not acquit the wicked. That means a lot of people have taken this and said, what do you mean? God is not going to forgive the sinner. There is no forgiveness for the sinner. There is no reprieve for him. There is no, you mean to tell me that there is no way that he can be saved? It seems to say that. It says the Lord will not acquit the wicked. So people take it to mean that the sinner can have no forgiveness. And then they connect it with Exodus chapter 23, verse 7, which says, I will not justify the sinner. Exactly same words, he says. I will not justify the sinner. I'm quoting exactly. I will not justify the sinner. In other words, let me even make it even simpler. I will never declare a sinner as righteous. That's what it's meant by I will not justify the sinner. I will never declare the sinner as righteous. Now people take this and they say, look brother, God says I will not acquit the sinner. I will not declare the sinner as righteous. So sinner has nowhere to go. No answer for his sin, no answer for his problem. Wrong. See, this is why we need a holistic look at the Bible. You need to study the Bible in a holistic manner. Do not just pick verses here and there and misunderstand them and go on thinking something about God and, and the whole thing. The whole point of the Bible, in fact, is how God acquits the sinner, if you think about it. If you read the Bible, the whole point of the Bible, what is the whole point of the New Testament, for example? What is the book of Romans about? It's about how God declares the sinner as righteous. But Deuteronomy, I mean, Exodus 23, 7 says, I will never declare a sinner as righteous. That's what God said. I will never declare a sinner as righteous. How do you understand this? Here it says, I will not acquit the wicked. But the whole Bible is about acquitting the wicked. God's great plan of salvation to acquit the wicked. God finding a way to get that done. So I'll explain what it means. Why it says it like this. Why the Bible says that God will not acquit the sinner. God will never declare the sinner righteous. But the whole Bible, if you read, it's about God finding a way and doing it really. And what does he do? He acquits the sinner. He declares the sinner as righteous. That's the whole story of salvation. Why? See, this is why you need to understand the Bible more thoroughly, you know. 
That's why I believe in teaching like this. Even in the Old Testament, forget about the New Testament. We'll come to the New Testament. I want to deal with the Old Testament first. Because some people think Old Testament is different. Yes, I agree, in some ways different. But essentially, it's not different. The God is the same. The problem with some people is that they think the Old Testament, God himself is different. That in the New Testament, he got saved, they think. <laughs> and he changed into a nice, kind God. Now he's behaving more decent. In the Old Testament, he was killing and destroying and, and uh, you know, doing all kinds of things. And now he's been reformed now. He's more a reformed God. <laughs> no, you're making up all these. Some people have made up all these things. God has never changed. He's the same from the first page to the last page. I'll show you. That's one mistake that people make. That Old Testament God is different from New Testament God, they think. No, it's one God. All right? And uh, another thing is, they think the Old Testament, the basis of blessing was the law. In the New Testament, the basis of God's blessing was grace. In the New Testament, there is grace. People live by grace. In the Old Testament, they live by the law wrong. I will show you in the Old Testament also from day one it was grace. Which law provided in the Garden of Eden all the fruit bearing trees, the four rivers, earth with gold growing underneath? Which law did they keep that provided all of these things, the good things that Adam and Eve were given in the Garden of Eden? No law. Grace. The grace of God gave all these things. So it starts with grace and ends with grace. It's the grace of God from the beginning. You can't say Old Testament was law, New Testament was It's a misunderstanding. Then what is the purpose of the law? You know, the reason the law was given was to prove man's sin. Why? Because man would not admit that he's a sinner. Just go and preach somewhere saying that you're a sinner, they'll chase you out. When I go to some other countries, I got to be very careful. You know, you can't even talk as freely as you talk here, you know. When you talk about sin, you know, they don't like to, they don't like to uh, hear a preacher tell them that people are sinners, you know. They think that's bad. We're not sinners. We're all right, you know. So the people of Israel were no different. Don't think only in the 21st century people are like that. They were like that way back then under Moses. They said, what's wrong with us? We're fine. We are the children of Abraham. We are this, we are that. God said, look, I'll show you what you are. Basically, something is flawed inside of you. You've got sin inside of you. That's what separates you and me. So I, I want to prove that to you. Here is 10 commandments. I'm giving you 10 commandments. And then he not only gave them, look at what he said. I don't have the time to read all that. He gave them the 10 commandments saying, do this and you shall live. Have you ever heard that? Some people took that and went in the wrong way. They said, oh, now God has given us a way to live. That if you do this, you can live. Did he mean that? Okay, if you do this, can you live? Yes, if you do this, you can live. The problem is you can't do that. Knowing that no one can ever do that, God literally puts it before them and says, do it and you shall live. Why? Because then only they'll start doing it because they want to live and everybody wants to live. And when they start doing it, then only they will find out that they're unable to do it because there is sin inside of them. In your presence, there is fullness of joy at your right hand. There are pleasures evermore. You surround us with your favor, O oh Lord. The earth is full. filled with your love in your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand but there are pleasures evermore you surround us with your favor oh lord the earth is full of your goodness the earth is filled with your exceedingly Joy. In your 
dreams And there is fullness of joy I'm sure I can There are pleasures ever Surround us It's your favor, oh Lord The earth is full of your goodness The earth is filled in your presence In your presence there is fullness of joy as you right and there are pleasures evermore. You surround us with your favor, oh Lord. The earth is full of your goodness. The earth is filled with your exceedingly, exceedingly. There is fullness of joy at your right hand. There are pleasures evermore. You surround us. It's your favor, oh Lord. The earth is full of your goodness. The earth is filled with your exceedingly, exceedingly abundantly far above. Fullness of joy at your right hand. There are pleasures evermore. You surround us with your favor, oh Lord. The earth is full of your goodness. The earth is filled exceedingly, exceedingly abundantly, far above all. There is fullness of joy at your right hand. There are pleasures evermore. You surround us with your favor. 